<coughs> I think uh, we can start uh, today's morning's Dharma talk. So yesterday we just uh, started with just a brief little introduction and overview of meditation coming into the present moment and just how easy it can be uh, after a little practice to be able to become aware of what's happening now and not being worried about the future or the past. And in particular, <coughs> the very wonderful little technique of now is the most important time, the thing which is right in front of you is the most important in the world, and the uh, only thing to do is to be kind. Now to take that a little bit further, because, quite frankly, that's all you really need to get into deep meditation. But, you know, we do have a complicated mind. And so, understanding that, it can be helpful to actually to start with what the Buddha calls some body awareness, and then go from there to some mind awareness, and then some breath awareness, stage by stage. But in the end, if any problems or trouble comes up, always go back to whatever you're aware of now is the most important and just to be with that. So this morning I'm going to just be talking for about half an hour and then I'm going to do a guided meditation for you. So that as I'm talking through the meditation it means that you can follow and get some experience instead of just listening. So those of you who've followed my talks on YouTube or been over to um, the Dhamma Loka Center on a Friday night and Saturday, we'll notice that I have started when we meditate, putting some attention on the posture, the way you are sitting. For the reason, two reasons. One is that it makes you comfortable and uh, at ease, so you can sit without too many physical problems. But number two, it is because you're developing some awareness and some kindness, some caring on something you're usually quite uh, familiar with, your own body. And it has some wonderful results as well. Once you are aware of your own body, you are familiar with it, you understand it, and you can become so aware of it, you know how it works, and you can relax it, and you can be just... Uh, so easy to get this body to be at ease and also you know, to get healthy. And um, many of you have been watching me over these years know that if you do get like a cough, it only lasts a couple of days. And other monks are just still sick, weeks, months. Any other sort of diseases and things which come, it's very easy to get to know them and just to allow them just to vanish. So, this body awareness and learning how this body works is very helpful just for your physical well-being and comfort. And an example which I uh, uh, give every so often was that there was one of the monks some time ago in Bodhinyana Monastery that every time he sat down to meditate he had, after a few minutes, had a very bad pain in his back. And you know, changing the posture this way, changing it that way, never helped. Even sitting on a chair apparently didn't help all that much. So eventually he went to go and see his GP. The GP referred him to a specialist. The specialist gave him an MRI scan of the spine. And when the results came back, the specialist said, you have a congenital deformity of your spine. It's weaker than normal and if you sit for too long in one position, it's going to cause you pain. He said, well, I'm a meditator. That's trying to like tell a cook not to eat. He said, well, you know, this is my passion. This is what I like doing. I'm a monk. I have to meditate. He said, well, you're going to be in pain. Nothing we can do. No operations possible. Nothing you could do about it. So when he came back from the, uh, the specialist, you know, he was in a bit of a problem, but it was good. When we have problems and we're in great difficulties, it's wonderful 
where those are very often places where new understandings and insights grow. If he didn't, if he didn't have that problem to begin with, he wouldn't have learned this wonderful technique and I would ha be short of another story about how meditation works. So, what he learnt was muscles on either side of your spine which exist, but I don't know anything about, you don't know anything about because you don't have to know anything about it. Much of your body, the muscles, the sinews, the bones, whatever, you know, they just look after themselves, so you don't have to worry about them. And because you don't have to worry about them, you don't have any awareness of them. But he really had to get to know the set of muscles on either side of the spine. And how to do that, he was taught, was to take his hand, and he knew exactly where they were in theory, and to, to um, stroke that area of his back on both sides of the spine, maybe half an hour every morning, regularly. So he did that as uh, an exercise. He had to keep, up, keep it up regular, regularly until he could feel those muscles without needing to touch them. In neurology, it's just creating the synapses. If you are mindful when you touch something, keep on doing it, keep on doing it, that part of the brain grows and you become sensitive to those muscles. So you could feel those muscles where you and I just don't even know they exist. So once he could feel the muscles on either side of his spine, then it took him a while, what we call trial and error, until he could move those muscles at will. He could stretch a muscle, he could loosen it, stretch it, loosen it, just by choosing, just the same way that I can just move my hand up or my arm up. And so that took him another few months of exercises to be able to learn how to move those muscles. Just like, you know, if anyone is unfortunate to have a stroke, they too have to learn again just how to move muscles or how to bypass any damage in one part of the brain or one part of the spinal cord or whatever it is, and to learn again how to do this. And it's very much the same, a bit of trial and error. Try this, this doesn't work, try that, that doesn't work, try this, ah, oh, that worked. So then, once he could start to move those muscles, then he could exercise them. Just like you do push-ups, or you do walking, he exercised those muscles every morning, until those muscles became so strong that they compensate for the weakness in his spine. So, no problem anymore. The whole purpose was so he could sit without any pain, but the way he solved that problem was very indicative of the sorts of things we can do once we have awareness of our body. We can do things, a little bit of trial and error, once we're aware of it, which, you know, can sometimes save our life. At least take away a lot of our problems. So, how does that relate to us? You may have aches and pains, but they're not that bad. So, what we do is we learn about our body. We have to learn how it feels. And a good starting point for that, just in this part of the talk, it's not where I usually start when I do the guided meditation, your bottom, your buttocks, against the, the chair or against the cushion, how do they feel right now? Can you be aware of them? The nice thing about buttock feeling is that they haven't got a name for it in English. You get toothache, you get hot, you got cold, you got itchy, you get achy, but that's for the rest of the body. I don't know if they have any of the uh, butt feeling in Cantonese or in Bahasa. You got a name for that? Feeling in the bot bottom. Because people don't really worry about it, so they just leave it alone. There's no name for it, which is helpful. It means that you can't start a conversation. You can't even start with a name. So, you feel it. Now, even though you can't give it a name, 
you can know it. You can feel it, and sometimes if it's comfortable or if it's um, if it's uh, uh, painful, and you can start to notice that it's subject to change. It gets worse. It gets better. And why? What do you do if you fidget? Oh, that feels better. The mindfulness, the awareness, allows you to get what we call feedback. You notice that these feelings, they are not going to stay like that. They get worse, they get better, and soon you can learn. Just like that monk learned you know, how to relieve that pain, you can learn what makes a butt feeling better. And that might think, to, well, so what? What happens if you've got uh, irritable bowel syndrome, which some people have? Or they have got um, an ache, stomach ache, or they have migraines, or they have other diseases and pains in their body. If you get to know how that part of the body works, you can feel that ache, feel that pain. It's not that hard to learn how to relax it. So the pain vanishes. And this is what, you know, I've uh, often, and sometimes you've got to um, say personal experiences, because I know those experiences. And li li hearing them from other people, yeah, you may exaggerate, when it's your own experience, you know how it works. And one of those occasions, some years ago, it's not the only one, many times, I was uh, after lunch at Bodhinyana Monastery, I went back to my cave because I had tummy ache. And I thought it was just a stomach ache, but as you know, I was meditating there after lunch, five minutes, ten, meter, ten minutes, it got much worse. And it wasn't indigestion, it was food poisoning. And food poisoning, you know it's food poisoning, even as a monk, you are sitting there trying to just, you know, just to see what's happening, and then, ah! Oh! Ah! <laughs> oh! <laughs> totally autonomous, you know, just come, you can't stop it, you go with it. And in the cave, you, maybe some of you have been in that cave, when those both doors are shut, no one can hear you screaming inside. So I'm not going to get any help from anybody. <laughs> so there you were, ah, ah. <laughs> and as I was screaming inside the cave, you know, just well, what to do, you know, just trying to open the door and crawl. You know, this is you know, quite a ways away. So if you really got very, very, very bad problems or whatever, yeah, you can get have doctors here, thank goodness. But if you try and call a doctor, you know what happened? You call them, your call is important to us, sir. We will get back to you on the first available operator. You are number 26 on the list. <laughs> Whatever. I don't think they usually do that, but I know sometimes that's what I remember. And so you're dying there, by the time the ambulance comes, you know, you're dead. <laughs> so anyway, we don't worry about that. So instead, what we did, or what I did, is just, oh, come on, we don't need ambulance. Sitting there, and becoming mindful of that part of the body, you know, your guts. Really being aware of it. Now, that was the most important time, that was easy. The feeling in my guts was the most important in the whole world, it dominated everything. What should I do? Yeah. It's a hard thing to do, to care with something which is totally unpleasant. It's really stinging, sharp pain. But you can do that, with a little bit of practice, you cared for it. And you know what happened? You, I noticed the pain, the next time you got a contraction, it was slightly less intense. Only a little bit less, in, less intense, but noticeable. The tightness, the pain, was less. 
carry on. And so still being kind, aware and kind, relaxing to the max. Ah! But it wasn't as painful again. It was getting less and less. It took me 20 minutes, give or take a couple of minutes here, a couple of minutes there. And by that time, the pain had just relaxed so much. There was no pain, irritation, ache left at all. My gut was just totally back to normal. And that's like a true story. It actually surprised me how fast you could do that, and but how simple it was. No medication, no sort of painkillers, just learning how to relax. So this is where, with mindfulness, and it is kindness, but to understand what kindness is, you actually feel what makes your body feel better. You learn how to have some even control over your own body, especially when it's in trouble. So you learn that even when you're meditating in a chair, in a, in a stool or a cushion, even doing walking meditation, when you're walking, how does it feel? How does your body feel? Does this make it feel better or feel worse? The mindfulness allows you to get feedback. And because you get feedback, if it's going in the right direction, you're getting more relaxed, more peaceful, carry on. You're getting more tense, more tight. Do something different. So when you start the meditation sitting down, Feel your body. How does it feel? Don't follow all the experts and say you have to sit full lotus with a straight back if you really want to get enlightened. And all that. I'll introduce the word. If you don't know it now, then you'll hear it many times. It's called Go Mayang. Go Mayang is a Pali word. And Go is the Pali word for, for the male cow, otherwise known as bull. Mayang is the word for, which in English spells S H I T. So together it spells bullshit. And people object to, to my language if I keep on saying that word too often. So instead, when there's something which is a lot of bullshit, I say, what a lot of go, my young. <laughs> <laughs> Translate it into Pali, and then people just let me off the hook. <laughs> so I'm not going to say the BS word anymore. Now it's always going to be go, my young. So there's a lot of go, my young, to say you have to sit cross-legged on the floor in full lotus on broken glass with a straight back and don't worry about anything in order with your, with your hands connected in a circle to your body or whatever that go mayang is, that's not necessary. What is necessary is you're comfortable and you're aware and you can feel that comfort. So I usually start with the, the, um, the legs. But when people meditate, a lot of times, you know, you get ache here or pain there and it really disturbs your meditation. Already someone yesterday said, what happens if your feet go, or your legs go numb. Yeah, I did say that wonderful because that means you have to have your leg amputated so you don't have to worry about it anymore, just get it over and done with, but I mean, that's just a joke. You can't really do that. But it does irritate you if you get an ache or a pain in your knees, or if they get numb, or if there's too much pressure on somewhere. It is an irritation. So why not look at it first of all? Get it nice and comfortable from the beginning. Really look at it. Be aware of it. Move it this way, move it that way. You get your feedback. No, it was better before, so you go before. No, just a little bit here. You just adjust it until it's the best you can possibly do. That takes awareness. And it also takes its kindness. Your legs are important. Then, sweep up to your butt. Because again, sometimes if my butt is not put in the right place, it starts to ache after a while. And it's just really nasty, all that pain. It's only a small thing, but it's just really quite irritating if you've got a sore butt. So you get your 
but just the right place, your cushion not too far forward, not too far back, not to the left, not to the right, just the right place. These days, of course, you've seen that meditation is getting so popular these days, we're getting state-of-the-art, high-tech meditation cushions. And from Silicon Valley, now you can get these cushions that, you know, you've got remote control. <laughs> so, you know, if it's a bit too, too high, you can just, and it goes down, you need a bit more on this, just this side, not the other side, so just to the right, and this side goes up. <laughs> If you need to put a bit forward, just so it goes forward. And because, you know, some of you, you know, come from, we come from all different countries. Some people like it cold, some people like it hot. So, you know, if you're a bit too cold, you can actually press another button and it warms up like those, those car seats in Japan, nice and warm. And if it's too hot for you, you know, you can actually cool down the temperature so it's nice and cool on your butt. And if you need, um, uh, if you get sloth and torpor, you press another button and this actually comes up, um, latte, cappuccino. <laughs> With sugar or syrup or whatever you want. So you just get that up, very nice. <laughs> I'm only making that up, but I don't know how many times I've made these silly comments and somebody hears it and they just start doing it. <laughs> so it's coming anyway, but anyway. So you get your body nice and comfortable. And then, there's your back. You feel your back. How is your back? And so, the back is such a sensitive part of your body. So many people have back pains. So, how'd your back feel now? Stretch it. Was that too tense? So just lean back. Or just lean to the side, or whatever. I'm really still quite surprised. Just this, oh yeah, in the back over there, there's somebody who's leaning against the wall. That is one of the most comfortable positions for you. You know, just a nice wall there, lean back, ah, oh, this is nice. So, on the chair, you don't have to sit bolt upright, otherwise we'd have wasted all this money getting the backrests. So if you want to lean back and that feels good, fine. Find out what is your best position with your back. It's called like experiment. And you get your feedback. How does it feel this? How does it feel that? Move this way, move that. And don't stop moving until you find the best position for you. And this is, you're going to go further with this all the way. Your hands. Do your hands feel better here or there? Or one here and one there, middle way? I don't know, how does it feel? So you find out what's the best position for your hands. Once you've got the position, They'll find, okay, you can stay there, I've looked after you now, you let go. Shoulders, neck, and the, the, the face. And so you go meticulously, systematically, right through your body, one part after the other, until the body is nice and relaxed. And what happens next, again, is, is an, another important part of meditation. Once your body is relaxed, how does it feel? Not just relaxation. Relaxation is very pleasant. It's enjoyable. It's pleasure, but good pleasure. It's one of the reasons why people pay a lot of money to go to spas or to get a massage. Because afterwards, you get a hit of relaxation pleasure. Now that is not indulgence, that is part of the path of meditation. So I'll read out later on in the word of the Buddha. These meditations create a happy body and a happy mind. It feels good. So, see if you can notice the pleasure of a relaxed body. That's important because number one, it will take you into deeper relaxation and it will start to uh, get you accustomed and get to know the pleasures which come from letting go and relaxation. The letting go happiness. And people say, well, isn't this getting attached? 
You can't get attached to things which come from letting go. It's what they call oxymoron. It's letting go is the cause. You try and get attached, you destroy it. So, we are just being with our body, calm, relax, this feels good. Now, you not only just relax the body and investigate in the role of delight and pleasure in meditation, now you go to your mind. Straight away, what do you mean, the mind? So, developed what we call the Peace-obiter. Just to give it a name so people can understand what the heck you're talking about. In a car you have a speedometer. On the aircon you have a thermometer. When I tell a joke you have the groanometer. <laughs> How bad the joke is. But we have all these ways of measuring things. And so, we also have a way of measuring how relaxed, peaceful, or how agitated, disturbed we are. So, right now, from number one to number ten, give me a number. How peaceful are you? Or how agitated are you? From one to ten. Now, most people say four, five, six, or whatever, but it doesn't matter. You're becoming aware of what I call the peaceometer. How peaceful are you? The peaceometer, right now. Doesn't matter what that number is. What is, once you can see the peaceometer or have some idea of what I'm talking about, then you can see it change. Sometimes you get more. Um, agitated. For example, if I start speaking in a loud voice very quickly and then you get very agitated because that's what it does when you speak in a loud voice. Can you see your mind getting more agitated? But when I speak in a soft, calming voice, can you notice your peace or meditation? Uh, <laughs> go closer to one. But you can actually see yourself getting more agitated or more peaceful. You're finding how to relax your mind. To bring it to a state of peacefulness. Not absolute peace, but you start to understand what agitates you and what calms you down. That's important. So once you get reasonably peaceful, you don't have to fall off the scale and go to sleep. Once you're reasonably peaceful, you will find it's again kindness, and it's pleasant to have a peace of mind. And as I mentioned last night, that once you get some peace of mind, you will discover for yourself that all those wandering thoughts, the thinking, the arguing, the philosophizing, the, the fantasizing, much of that disappears. Because you're at peace, happily so, it's just like the body when it's relaxed, it's really pleasant. When the mind is peaceful, that too is really pleasant. You don't want to disturb it with crazy thoughts, you're actually pretty much quiet. Not totally quiet, but much more so than usual. So now what you do, it happens quite naturally, but at this point I usually ask people, now please become aware of your breathing. Naturally, it doesn't matter which nostril doesn't matter how it goes in, long or short or medium, just you become aware you're breathing. And look at your breath. This was, they were saying this yesterday, last night, or alluding to it. But look at your breath like a best friend. 
My breath here, this breath coming in and out, in and out, in and out. Nice and peacefully, calmly. You're not controlling your breath. You're just observing it. And at the same time, just noticing what makes the breath become more agitated, what makes it smoother and calmer. It's the peaceometer again, but now it's the peaceometer, the breathometer. So you can see the breath, peaceful going in, peaceful going out. So you're becoming aware all the time of whether your breath is getting more peaceful or whether your breath is getting more agitated. Whether your mind is, if your breath gets agitated, it's not delightfully peaceful. That's when you can start thinking, you get bored. What am I supposed to be doing this for? Whatever. So remember, just in this moment, being kind. And when the joy, delight comes up, please notice it. Don't think there must be something wrong, I'm enjoying this. You're supposed to be enjoying meditation. That's why, for those of you who haven't heard this one before, what do we call Jhana Grove Meditation Retreat Centre? What's his other name? His other name is Club Med. West Australia. This is our Club Med. Meditation. <laughs> so when you call it something different, oh, it's a monastery, it's a temple, it's, oh, it's just really tough. You call it Club Med. And then straight away, that gives you the, the idea that this is fun. This is happy. This is delightful. It's something which you want to do because it's enjoyable. So, that's another reason why I don't like any bells. Why do you have to have a bell to force someone to meditate? Just get up and you meditate, because you want to. You like it. It's something you just want to do. So, and when you start noticing the joy and happiness in meditation, breathing in, breathing out, oh, this is so nice. Then, you realize that this is meditation. And that meditation goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And I'll talk about those things at another time. But now I promised I was going to do a guided meditation for you. So now we can actually start. Just recapping on what I've just been talking about. Only going to be about 20, 25 minutes. Not that long. Very good. So close your eyes. The reason why we close our eyes is because it gives more capacity for our brain to feel the sensations in our body. Not so much bandwidth, if you like, is taken up through seeing and processing visual data. So first of all, with your eyes closed, just get your body roughly comfortable, just an approximation to comfort. And then we do fine tuning. So your legs, from your toes up to the top of your thighs, how are they feeling? There's one way, many ways, but one way to get awareness on part of the body is to ask the question, legs, how are you? It's not a silly question. When you ask a question like that, you get an answer. 
you feel the sensations in your legs. And now, can I make you more comfortable legs? Do you need some adjustments? Even if you think you don't need to make adjustments, make one anyway. Move something, scratch something, just so you can actually see things change. And you understand what I mean, that when you move, the awareness shows whether it's better or worse. So you're learning. Sometimes it's trial and error. You move and it's less comfortable, so go back again. But at least you're learning. And when your legs are comfortable, they feel comfortable, the best you can do. Only then move up the body to your butt. Feel the pressure of your bottom against the cushion, the stool, the chair. Do you need to fidget to make it more comfortable? Please do so now. Then it's not disturbing later on. It's an investment of time, a skillful means. And once your butt is comfortable, again you move up to your back, include your waist. And those who have listened to me at Nolamara Temple, I'd like to stretch at this point, get into this <coughs> habit of a good stretch, because you see animals like dogs and cats do this, and even kangaroos have a good stretch. Feels good. Once I've stretched my back, then I relax it. And then I have my awareness of the comfort in my back. Do I need to move it, to adjust it? If you're sitting on a chair, do you want to lean back on the backrest, or lean forward, or slump? There is no best posture which works every time. Some days you need to slump, sometimes you need to be straight, sometimes you need to lean back. Find out today what you need to be comfortable. And then, when my back is reasonably comfortable, I move to my hands. Hands, how are you down there? You want to be moved. You want to be adjusted. I will adjust you, just to see if that's any better. Where I learn. And once I paid attention for a minute or two to my hands, then I can let them go. I move up to my shoulders. The shoulder blades are a place where much physical tension is stored. So I'm aware of those shoulder blades, and how can I relax them? One of the things which I learned how to do was a visual experiment. I visualize my shoulders to be a bundle of strings on either side of the spine. And those strings all bundled up are being stretched at both ends. That's called tension. My shoulders tense. They're being pulled apart. And then I imagine just letting go of both ends of those bundles of strings. When I imagine that, the shoulders, the muscles in the shoulders, they relax too. And importantly, I'm mindful of that area and I can feel my shoulders relax. My awareness gives me the feedback, yes, they are relaxing.
and it feels good. And then I move out from the shoulders to the neck. First of all, that people have neck pain because their head is not properly balanced on top of the neck. So move your head back, forward, left, right, to find the optimum, the best position for your head on top of your neck. Once you find the best position, sometimes if it's a bit stiff, it's almost like exercises, back and forth, back and forth. Give it a bit of a, a workout, your neck muscles. And of course, inside as well. Many people have coughs, irritations in the throat. It makes your throat inside feel all itchy, irritated. So what you can do, what I was doing when I had my pony virus, little horse, you just look in there, feel the irritation. Really get to know the irritation. And then you experiment. So little by little, that irritation in your throat, just like the story of the, the irritation in my guts, called food poisoning. The irritation in your throat, you get to know it. You can relax it, so it eases. And the throat becomes really peaceful, calm. And the irritation, the itch, far, far less than when you started. And once you've dealt with your throat, you move up the body to your face. People can read your emotions on your face. If you're afraid, excited, angry, you can see it on people's faces. And the muscles, they are tightened in a particular way which shows you your emotions. And now we're trying to relax the muscles of the face so our emotional world can also relax. You feel those muscles around your eyes in particular and your mouth and your forehead. Can you feel them, get to know them? Especially if they're tense. And a little bit of trial and error. Try this, try that until you learn how those muscles on your face become more relaxed, more peaceful. Your awareness allows you to see change. Change for the better, change for the worse. Sometimes you get it wrong. At least you're learning. So you can relax those muscles around your face. And feel them opening out, relaxing. And now you've relaxed your whole body, from the toes to the head, at peace. You may not be 100% relaxed, but I would hope by now you're far more relaxed than when you started this meditation session. Can you notice that even that degree of relaxation is very pleasant? You feel the relaxed, open, pleasant body. Just relax, nothing being held tight. The more that you can recognize the delight of relaxation, the more relaxed you become. And once you are relaxed enough, whatever that means, but maybe you relax too much and fall asleep at this point, now look at your peaceometer. How peaceful are you inside? 
One means really peaceful. Number ten means getting very agitated. And not caring about what that number is. Just want you to be able to be aware of the peaceometer. Like the thermometer knows if it gets cold or if it gets hotter. Now what makes your mind more peaceful? What allows the inner world to get more and more calm? Hopefully you make the connection that what makes you calm is opening the door of your heart to this moment. Kindness. Allowing things to be. Then you find that the mind becomes more and more peaceful and more closer to one than to ten. You can always go back to that peaceometer at any time to make sure that you are indeed moving closer and closer to peace. But now, are you breathing in or breathing out right now? Don't interfere with the breath. Just get to know it. It doesn't matter if the breath is long or short, because your body does a breathing every day, every night, hasn't missed one yet. So you can trust your breath not to let you down. So see if you can regard the breath not as your slave to tell what to do and how to do it, Regard the breath is like your friend. You're just going to spend time with her, with your breath, enjoying one another's company. Watching the breath come in and watching the breath go out. If it helps, as you're breathing in, say to yourself, breathing in, peace. And breathe out, let go. Breathing in, peace. Breathe out, let go. You find that does make you more calm, more peaceful. The needle of the peaceometer goes closer to one. Carry on. If it's too disturbing, then stop it.
How does that feel now? How peaceful is your mind? And can you notice that peace is delightful, is pleasurable? How comfortable is your body? How relaxed is it? May not be 100% relaxed. Can you notice, notice it's far more relaxed than when you began? And this you should recognize is very healthy. Peace of mind relaxes the body. Now in a few moments, the meditation will be over. So very slowly, carefully, open your eyes. Now the meditation is ended. So, oh. Hopefully, giving a lead into the meditation, not just theory, but tying it to some practice. You sleepy people there, probably because you ate too many pancakes for breakfast like I did. <laughs> but they were nice. But don't worry, because later on the energy comes up. And you have a wonderful time. So... That guided meditation, it's already people put their little machines here. You can always uh, get copies of guided meditations. And people do have these machines, the iPhones and the iPads and these little things. So you can always record them. And if even on this retreat, it's the afternoon or early in the morning and you know you feel you do need some guidance, Someone likes sitting next to you, you can get these things out, get some of the earbuds and listen to it while in the morning meditation or the afternoon meditation when the monk or the teacher's not around. Which means that you've always got someone there because if you try it for yourself at the beginning, you haven't meditated much before, then what am I supposed to do? <laughs> and you fall asleep or you just go wandering off. But once you listen to a guided meditation, you know, over and over and over again, it becomes second nature. It's more brainwashing, more conditioning, and you just do it naturally. In exactly the same way when you learn how to drive a car, you have to be with a driving instructor sitting next to you. Until the, you know, you points out your force, it guides you until it becomes easy. You don't need the instructor anymore. That's the same with meditation. So, any questions about that today, just before we finish off and we start the interview session? Yes. One thing at the beginning, if you feel a bit of aches and pains, move. Because if you move, say you've got an ache in your knee, then trying to endure it just makes meditation really uncomfortable and soon you go away with the idea of meditation is endurance. But instead of that, just if you've got an ache in your knee, keep your eyes closed, it only takes about 10 seconds mindfully change the posture. And then carry on. When the pain disappears, it only takes one or you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds, and then it's gone. So it's okay to do that at the beginning, uh, you know, when you first start meditating. You can adjust the posture, 
But then later on, you say, well, why did it start to hurt like that? You didn't pay much attention or enough attention at the beginning of the meditation to get the body comfortable from the very start. And we are all getting old, so it's okay to sit on a chair. Just because, you know, you're leading the Indonesian delegation, you don't have to be super man. <laughs> so if you want to sit in a chair, fine. <laughs> but don't kill yourself. Okay, so we're going to have the interviews now. The interviews, please keep it to 10 minutes. So, if it's over 10 minutes, it's bad karma. Because <laughs> other people will have, to, <laughs> will have, to, have to wait for you. And it does finish at 20 past 10, because uh, for lunchtime, as you noticed yesterday, I go over to the Bodhinyana Monastery, because many people come and visit on the weekends, and I have to attend to those as well, and also to make sure that there's uh, no problems at the monastery, which I have to deal with. So that's why that at 20 past 10, roughly, that's when I disappear. So please don't put, oh no, 11 o'clock, put another name down, another name down, another name down. So please just keep it to that. This, if you really need an interview, there's always a possibility, I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it, there's always a possibility after the Sutta class. So if you need one, importantly, then after Sutta class at 4 o'clock, have interview. Okay, so, Sadhu, Sadhu, Sadhu. <laughs> Very good. Okay, have a wonderful morning. <laughs>